Looks good. All right, I'm going to sw uh, switch over to um, the can uh, to a view of my browser, Chrome. So just let me know if you're able to see that if you're having any trouble. So it should be showing Chrome now for everybody. And is that working for you? Oh, let me turn this out. Pardon me. I couldn't hear anybody. My audio is down. Okay, so my audio is up now, and you should be able to hear me. Ah. Okay. Looking good for me, Ron. Okay, cool. All right. So um, for most of the presentation, I'll go ahead and just keep it on the uh, screen here on the Chrome. So first of all, thank you for attending the program webinar. I really appreciate you taking the time to show up. Um, so what I wanted to do was to go through and um, talk about the um, HCI program, which is uh, now five years old, and talk about um, uh, some of the um, uh, goals that we have and um, and competencies and have this and uh, and about lectures as well. So so the HCI program is now about five years old, um, and you may have actually received an email from Leslie. Heiser Newquist, she's our dean, and it has the uh, HCI five-year program review in there. And so I, I encourage you to take a look at that when you have a, a opportunity, if you haven't already read it, and it's be really good to give you some uh, perspective and some insight into our program and the challenges we face. Um, one of the challenges mainly is low enrollment and, uh, and how we can work to improve this uh, and our goals for, all, for the next several years. Um, okay, so did you all get the URL? Is that showing up on the chat? Because you should have a URL to this lecture here. Okay, I'm not hearing anybody. Yeah, I received it. This is Dale. Hi, Dale. Thank you. And uh, Jonathan Montasser, you have it as well. Okay, and I'm showing Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Great to see you. <laughs> Hi. Cool. Okay, so um, our program used to have a uh, on-campus faculty meeting, and this is where the adjunct faculty and the staff would get together, and we'd actually meet up in a classroom on campus. But um, uh, in the last year or so, there's been a shift away for, from that. From uh, And so our faculty are, well, we've always taught online. Our program's been online, but now most of our faculty are coming from all over the country, so it doesn't make sense to really meet on campus. We have people, we have um, at least, well, I think two instructors from Texas, instructor from, from Tennessee and other parts of the country. So um, therefore it uh, makes more sense for us to be meet virtually. And this is our first um, all faculty meeting. And just to remind people that we are recording this. So those of you, so those faculty who couldn't be here are able to, um, able to tap into this at a later time. And so as I mentioned when I first started, my, the purpose here is to take about 30, 30 maybe 40 minutes to check in on some of our goals, uh, specifically with, with teaching, uh, lecture uh, creation, and how this relates to student success. And then Montasser, he's also gonna touch base on uh, core competencies as, as it relates to the program. And then I hope too that we have a few minutes for questions and feedback. I just wanted to take um, one minute to have us go around and introduce ourselves, uh, since most of us haven't had, had an opportunity to actually speak to each other. Um, and so, uh, just really quickly, um, my name is Ron Austin, and I'm the the, um, the e-learning specialist. And I've been teaching at the college um, for about 18 years, and I've taught uh, programming here. I don't teach as much anymore because I'm working full time uh, within HCI, but I still teach probably about one class a quarter. And so, uh, if there's someone who would like to go next, that would be awesome. And just take like 30 seconds just to introduce yourself and your role in the program. Hey, uh, it's Michelle Warfield. I'll go next. Hi, um, my name is Michelle Warfield and I'm an online adjunct instructor. I am the first one that joined the program um, back when it started um, teaching online. Uh, I've been at Bellevue for four years and I love it. I teach between one and two uh, courses every quarter. Um, I have a master's in learning and technology. Um, and I also have 10 years in healthcare IT, 
26 years in the IT industry. So um, I come with subject matter um, background. And that's what I know. All right, thanks, Michelle. Awesome to have you join us. I'm, I'm Jonathan Molinero. I'm the writing specialist in the program. Uh, I've been, uh, I'll be here for, for two years coming in the summer. And, uh, and I've worked with uh, most of you already, but if I haven't, feel free to reach out and I help create resources and sites and assignments and, and help students one-on-one -on -one with their academic skills and writing. All right, great, thank you. Maricel, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Ron. So my name is Maricel. I have been teaching at the college for almost four years now, and I have been an instructional designer for the program um, since last year. I also have taught one class um, for the program that was data analytics last quarter, and it's a pleasure to work um, with all of you. Awesome. Hey, Dale, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you, Dr. Dale Gooden. I've got a doctor in health sciences uh, with a specialization in education, a master of business administration uh, with a specialization in health services management. I've been working for Lab Corporation of America for the past two years and in healthcare slash health uh, or life sciences for about 10 years now. Uh, this will be my first quarter or semester at Junking here at Bellevue, and I'm really uh, looking forward to the uh, opportunity to teach more and add more value uh, at the university or at the college, and thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, Del. Appreciate it. All right. I'll call on uh, another person. Uh, Montasser, would you like to uh, introduce yourself for one minute? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Montasa Kadri. Uh, joined the college uh, last year. I'm a full-time faculty in the program HCI. Uh, and um, I have many years of experience in the healthcare industry and a uh, fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. And uh, I do really enjoy teaching online and help our students uh, move forward. So. Nice to meet you all. All right, thank you, Montasser. Kim? Hello there, this is Kimberly Hassel. I am the program manager for the Bachelors in Health Informatics. And I've been with the college for six years. I started back when the program was still an idea. And so it's been exciting to see it evolve from just um, curriculum written on a piece of paper to actually having 30 graduates now. Uh, so yeah, and I, um, I support, in my primary role, I support students as their advisor, and I manage the administrative side, all of the budgets, and those sort of behind the scenes things that keep the program running. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Lauren, I think you're listed under my name, if, if you wanna take a minute just to introduce yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, I don't know why I show up as you, but um, anyhow, <laughs> yeah, hi. I'm Lauren Somosifis, and I'm one of the instructional designers, and I've worked with most of you. And um, yeah, other than that, I, I actually teach over at North Seattle College and I do some work in healthcare fraud and I have some students I'm about to send over to the informatics program. <laughs> so. That's great. Awesome. All right. Well, um, yeah, so we, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll go ahead and get into it here. You should still be seeing the, uh, the, the screen here for, it's called Fulfilling the Online Credit Hour. And um, so much of this, uh, this short webinar is just going to focus on some things that are helpful to keep in mind as we develop our lecture content, and also how the instructional design team may be able to assist you with aspects of, of, of the learning and the lectures as, as, as we create. And so speaking as, as someone who's taught online myself, um, I find that developing lectures is just, it really is one of the most challenging things um, about teaching. And, uh, one thing is, for me, uh, it's hard to know how much content to develop, uh, how little, or if it's too much. And it's weird because uh, when we teach on campus, um, and I think some of you, or maybe all of you, have probably taught on a physical campus at some time or another, but when we teach in a classroom, you know, we, um, we show up, 
and we were going to boot up our computer or, or whatever, and we and students arrive, and then we start our lecture. And so even if we don't spend the majority of time uh, lecturing in the classroom, we do know that we need to fill the time somehow because we're physically on campus, right? And so we have to have something because the students aren't going to just sit there and stare at us. So um, if we meet uh, twice a week, as some of the classes do on campus, or, or every day for an hour, we have to have some interactive activities, we have to have um, in-class exercise, and a discussion or two. And generally, most instructors do still, you know, still lecture um, for 30 minutes or so, uh, or an hour, depending on the length of the class and how often it meets. But, um, but, and also too, this is gonna be usually in addition to out of class material. And so we'll likely have assignments, right? That you'll give people every week or two, and then you'll have some homework, and then there may be a quiz or exam that they're gonna be studying for. So there's gonna be both the on-campus, um, uh, or excuse me, yeah, the, the in-campus, the, the, the in-class time, as well as the out-of-class time with the physical classroom. And so um, let me direct our attention over here to the introduction if you haven't had a chance to look at it. And so the way this works, I think most of your classes have this set up already. We're using this format, it's called rise.articulate. And Articulate is the company and they make um, uh, software for developing lectures. So this is what we're uh, using at this time. And so you can click on start lecture. And as, as I said, most of you probably already have this in your classroom. So you've probably seen the setup. Um, if you're on Bellevue campus, it's going a little slow, but uh, uh, just bear with me as we get into this. So for the introduction here, um, there's this thing called the three to one uh, ratio. And I don't know how many of you may have heard of this before, but I'll, I'm just going to give a brief overview for probably about three minutes here. And of course, we know that online classes are not anything new. Right, the world's been offering online classes for like 20 years now, and in fact, Bellevue College um, started offering the classes around 1998. And I was actually a student in one of the first online classes, and the topic was developing online content. So it was a class on HTML. Okay, but <laughs> but even though the classes, the online content still isn't new, um, sometimes it's not really obvious for how to develop uh, how much content. And even within BC, within Bellevue College, there's going to be a lot of difference here from one course to another. Uh, to some degree, even within our own program, HCI, but certainly within the larger uh, department, HSEWI, there'll be, there's going to be, uh, there's not really a standardization between different classes. Of course, that's because classes cover different topics and so forth, but also it's just not something that we talk a lot about as a faculty. And so how does one know how much to develop for an online lecture uh, and how, or how little, right? And are there any actual guidelines? And it doesn't really seem like there's, it, excuse me, I'm talking a little fast here, I'll slow down. Um, it doesn't seem like there's any rules, right? But there is actually um, some standardizations to go by. Um, and these uh, are known as um, really the three to one ratio um, has, well, uh, I was going to ask this as a question. I mean, has, has, has everyone, has, has, have, have any of you heard of the Carnegie unit and the student hour? Maybe all of you have, because a lot of you do focus on, on education and you have a doctor and uh, several of you have doctors in education. So you've probably heard of this at one time, but the Carnegie unit and the student hours is, is a standardization, which has been around, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think since uh, probably the 1880s. Um, the Carnegie unit was initially developed to measure how much interaction faculty have with students. So that, um, so actually uh, Carnegie, uh, who was um, uh, funding retirements, they wanted to keep track of how much people were working, um, how much time faculty were working. So, so the, they developed this measurement um, known as the three to one ratio. And then this eventually became extrapolated out um, separately, uh, set forth by the Department of Education. And so the Department of Education took on this, and most high schools and colleges follow this three to one rule. And it directly relates to diplomas and graduation and so forth. So um, when people, so there's actually um, two standards. One is for like retirement, and the other one is for meeting um, degree requirements. Um, when people are referencing three to one, they're usually talking about the second with the degree um, re, uh, requirements. Um, <clears throat> so what it means is that um, for every college credit, this is typically true, it's not, a, it's not universal 100%, but it's typically true 
that for every college credit a class is worth across most any college, um, uh, public or private, um, that for every college credit a, pers uh, a student spend two hours outside of class with reading and activities, you know, such as homework or whatever, um, and then they'll spend one hour in class interacting with the faculty. And so this should usually be like the lecture or the discussion in the classes. Um, so um, most of our classes are more than one credit. And many of our classes in HCI are, I think, five credits, right? So this means that a student is expected to spend 10 hours per week outside of class with the reading and activities. And the student is also expected to spend five hours per week in class with the lecture discussion. And there can be a quiz in there and so forth too. So where it gets, um, I don't know if, if murky is the right word, but there's, but there's no hard set rule about how much of the five hours, right? For a five credit class, how, how much five hours per week should be lecture or other material in class. And there's not a lot of data out there in the online world to support how long lectures take, right? So obviously, if you record a half hour of audio, well, obviously that takes a half hour for someone to listen to, at least, unless they pause it and, and play it and so forth. But if, if there's a lot of text on there and a lot of images, there's not necessarily, uh, well, there's not a lot of data out there to support how long it takes to get through that text lecture content. And then the reason why uh, this is important uh, also, let me actually, there's a continue button down here, which talks about why it's important. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, ethically, we want to deliver good material for our program. And then also, uh, programs are continually, um, audited and, and audits are generally done, um, by accreditation boards, of course, uh, in the U S department of education. And so it's not just all talk because you may have heard of Western governors, university and they've ran into problems because they haven't had enough student contact hours um and there's other colleges as well i don't know lauren do you have do you have anything to <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot but i don't know yeah, yeah, um, yeah, no, yeah. Saint, uh, saint mary's was uh one that cited um in this sort of why should i care quotes here um saint mary's uh lost um their accreditation because or or for financial aid so basically they had to pay back any monies that had been received because of financial aid because hello hello oh i don't know is everybody here i'm sorry can you guys hear yes i can oh, hear okay. you now i just got a flash saying that my internet connection is unstable so it's probably bellevue college at work anyways go on sorry. Oh, okay sorry yeah uh I, I'm just talking away. I don't know if anyone's hearing me. <laughs> so, anyhow, yeah. So St. Mary's was one of the big ones, and they're quoted in the article below, um, kind of about what happened to them. But yeah, they were saying that the instructors were not having, um, uh, were not guiding students with lectures. They were not having interaction in the discussion rooms with the students, and so basically, they could not find substantive and regular interaction. And that's. When, they're, uh, when the Department of Education is auditing online courses, they're looking for regular and substantive interaction. So that means that they have to be in there regularly and they have to be having meaningful interaction and that can be um, done in a variety of ways, but yeah. All right, super cool, thank you. And then um, as you're looking through this, um, you know, there's the, the part here, why should I care? And then there's, uh, it's, it's, it's an image carousel. So you can go through and see quotes um, that have information about that. And then also, what can you do? There's an article down here that talks more about um, interpreting what's required for regular and substantive interaction. Uh, good to look at because it covers both, you know, creating lectures and then also uh, other type of interactions. So such as uh, setting up discussions and so forth like that. All right, um, so we're going, we're actually, um, uh, going a little slow here so i'm gonna jump jump to the next one here and this next one here is time on task and so time on task is um this relates to a survey that mary cell uh created and it's a time on task survey in which you as the faculty thank you very much for participating in this and um so for those of you who are teaching the program you had an opportunity to to evaluate how much time you felt that your students spent on the course material and then we also gathered information from, 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 from the 
questions, I'm going to turn it over to Maricel for a few minutes, and she'll talk about this time on task survey. Here you are. Hi. Um, because you have access to uh, these awesome uh, material that Ron and, and Lauren put together, you can also go through it um, by yourself. But um, because we are uh, promoting these or trying to research on how well we are doing, we uh, thought about getting some data. We have a um, few responses, and of course, we cannot draw conclusions, but it's the first step um, on our journey to um, you know, do research and get, um, you know, um, a statement based on data. So we created this um, time on task survey actually using Office 365, the form Fisher, and we got 19 responses and we got seven responses from faculty. So it's important to notice that it doesn't mean that we had 19 students um, responding to that survey. You can see the distribution on this um, chart of the classes and the student who responded. Uh, one, one student could have actually responded to um, the survey multiple times based on how many classes they were taking. I should add though, sorry Marisol for interrupting, mm -hmm. but I just want to add the, that there were at least 11 or 12 students who responded, which is a good turnout. Oh, oh well, okay, but I mean individual students. Uh, individual students, yeah, right. like 11. And, and, and that's important to point out because uh, as, as most of you know, we do have a small number of students in the program. So that's actually not insignificant. So that's yeah. good. So we asked different questions and um, basically the same questions that we asked um, to the faculty, we asked to the students. And because you already respond this, um, to these questions, you already have a feeling of what we ask. So we put together a few results here um, regarding how much time do you feel your students spend in the class and also the student response. So you can see the results on this tab here. So this is a faculty response overall, and this is the student um, response overall. And we actually have the database also um, individually by classes. So if you are teaching a class, you can also look at, you, at the student response based on your class. What we notice overall from these um, student response and your response as a faculty, most of the programs the students spend over 10 hours a week um, for, for the classes. And because all of them are five credits, we are mostly meeting um, the target for uh, the requirements of the state that Ron was talking about. We also have the activities. We divided um, the time on task based on the activities and most of the classes we have similar activities that like discussions, final project, require readings, listening, assignment, quizzes, etc. So you have the faculty response here. How much do you think um, the student is spent on every task and also the student response. And we, when we put this chart together next to each other, you see a similarity between your, um, your expectation and time and also the students, what the student thinks about um, spending time on this, on this task. Regarding the, um, the best learning experience, um, we have a little bit of difference between what the faculty thinks and what the students um, think. Overall, on um, those that you agree that they bring the best learning experience, your response matches with the student response. And we also have this data based on a comparison between the Okay, we lost it just for a second. I think we're back now. Okay, so this is based on how much students agree. So they really think that the listening and readings bring the best learning experience, but also the assignments. So these, you, you can actually see the, um, I mean, your response on it. If you compare that with the students, they um, it strongly agree on the listening and reading, but they agree most on the assignments. So they actually think that the assignments bring the best learning experience for them. So um, we have other, other uh, questions that we didn't put in here, but I'm trying to look, let me go up. 
Okay, so what we wanted to actually share with you are the quotes. We asked the students to share um, what they thought about the design and the assignments. Um, so you can go to the up of the. Oh, guys, I hate to interrupt. We can't see the the screen isn't sharing anymore. I don't think. Oh. oh okay. okay. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, you know, and also one other thing too is uh, I just want to make sure that everyone has the link because I don't know how Zoom works. So, but here I'll just go ahead and post. Yeah, it's post. in the, the the link is in the in the dialogue, the chat box. Yeah. Okay, I was just wondering if someone came on later, if it would still show up for them. Oh, it, oh I mean, it's just <laughs> case. Okay, now let me share the screen again. So, thanks for bringing that up. Um, there we are. Okay, hopefully it's showing showing now. And uh, let me actually, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure it's only showing the Chrome. Okay. Okay. Um, is, is that working now, Lauren? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. So you can actually read different quotes that, um, not quotes, but comments that a student added uh, based on the uh, survey that we shared with them. And as I said, we have these responses based on um, every single class. So if you want to have access to all of the responses for your class, just um, let me know. But these, um, to conclude with this survey, these um, give us some ideas and explanations on how we are supporting the three to one ratio and to keep building on this information. Awesome. Thank you. All right, we still have everybody, or uh, we have connection, right? I'm just making sure. Because we're getting pop-ups that say your internet connection is unstable, so. Um, any questions so far? Or comments? All right. <laughs> okay, I'm assuming everyone's there. Okay, so. Um, looks great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for the next one here, uh, this is working with the instructional design team. Well, first of all, you may you may know this that um, it's extremely rare to have an instructional design team working with a program, and so um, uh, we hope this works out to be um, very fortunate events because um, our job here is to help is to help um, the students and help you uh, prepare the lecture content as, as you want. And so, of course, the idea is that you are the subject matter expert. Uh, we are not the subject matter experts, and so we just want to help reinforce your, your material and, and, uh, and so forth. So, um, the way that the, that the module format um, has been created um, is that uh, with the lack of, uh, excuse me, uh, stating the obvious here, that the idea of, uh, of designing the lecture content around what the students will need to, to know when they're done with the course. And so that's going to be our objectives here. And to meet the objectives, um, we have broken up the material into certain sections. So we have preparation, interaction, evaluation, which you may have seen in your courses. So let me hop on over to one here. This is uh, 380. And so in, in 380, this is Lauren's course uh, that, uh, that um, she taught one class um, a little bit ago. and, and uh, and so this one was set up with preparation, interaction, evaluation. You see that the preparation will have the lecture content and overview. The interaction it will use, uh, typically be discussions, and then we have the quiz material in there and assignments. All right. So um, let me go back here. Thank you. Um, so as we're developing the lecture content, down below here, we have some um, guidelines, uh, suggestions um, for how you can create the content. And um, we recommend using audio as you can. And so you could actually record your audio just into a PowerPoint. Some of you have done that, and that's awesome if you do that. Uh, we do ask that when you um, record uh, into a PowerPoint um, that we don't transcribe, and um, because that's just going to take too long, uh, especially if you don't work from a script. If you don't work from a script, then we have to type every single word. It just, it's, it's not um, time effective for us at all. So, um, so write up your, your transcript and then just read from that. That'd be super helpful. Um, and then you can also, um, for your lectures, obviously you can provide links as well to outside uh, material. And you can um, feel free to use YouTube material or Vimeo uh, material, especially we find that um, TED Talks is an excellent source of material for students. 
And so just, you know, uh, of course, uh, check it out first, make sure that it relates uh, directly to what you're teaching that week. And um, the, the TED Talks is great. And those are, the, a TED Talk is, is always going to be captioned. And so that's, that's an excellent resource. Um, and then uh, obviously you can write the lectures as well, and we can help you with that and expand upon it to make those lectures uh, more interactive. Um, and then let's see here. Uh, uh, your discussions at the bottom here, um, we do recommend that you develop the discussions around open-ended questions. And we mentioned that because uh, uh, you, have, uh, you want to be careful about that because there are some times in the past where lectures haven't been open in, uh, excuse me, discuss discussions have not been open-ended. And then if they aren't open-ended, then um, well, someone could just answer it with a yes or a no, right? Yes. <laughs> or um, there are some times where the discussion is um, about answering the questions and everybody is answering exactly the same questions from the lecture, from the discussion, and that doesn't promote open-ended discussions. So if you have a question that everybody is gonna answer on the same way based on a video, leave those questions as a quiz, as individual, and try to create open-ended questions, and we can help with that. It also makes it easier for them um, when they have to read and respond to each other if they haven't all said the same thing. <laughs> so. Exactly. Oh yeah, that's and that's a good thing to point. Um, and sorry if I'm kind of just repeating what you said, Marisol, but just mm -hmm. that you can set those so so people can't see each other's writing first, right? And so you can go in and, and set that, and then they can't see the other students, and then they can come on in and and uh, and write their own. And then once they submit it, then they can see what other people do. And usually we require that they, that they comment on each other's uh, uh, discussions as well, so. Okay, um, Lauren, do you wanna talk about? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Um, if you wouldn't mind flipping the little cards. Uh, sure. <laughs> since I don't have it open. Um, so yeah, so for getting started with the lectures um, or with your written material, cause you know, we can make it interactive for you. Um, with getting started with them, um, some things to consider are to be engaging and to bring as much of your personal experience in as you can, but to stay focused um, because it's easy when you're sort of telling war stories, you know, from the front lines of healthcare IT to go off track. So be engaging, but keep it on track. Um, and some of the things, I guess the cards aren't flipping here, but um, to watch out for, thank you. <laughs> Um, if you take over a class that has been personalized, be sure that you change it out so you're not using the same story from somebody else because it's not actually your story. Um, and then another one is there's, there's oftentimes a lot of references to page numbers, and it, it, it's helpful if you can avoid that because um, it, it, you know, the additions change, the reading materials change. Uh, but if you could give us, the designers, the information, we could maybe make something interactive out of it so that you don't have to reference the page number. We can, we can do something with it for you. Yeah, this is, a, uh, this is a big one here for referencing the page numbers. And I do that myself in my own lectures that I create for programming class. But then, especially if it's an audio lecture, but either way, you're going to have to change that when the, uh, when the book is updated or as you switch the book. And, or if the, if the instructor changes, right? So that's just something definitely to keep in mind. So thank you, Lauren. Yeah. And then um, we've included an article in here, um, the link to it that you guys might want to read because it's, it gives really good information about the powerful um, use of images and how using images can really increase retention um, versus just using um, text. And it also gives a great warning about why you should not have bullet points on screen while you're talking. And you'll kind of see that when we go through the next section because I have words on the screen and then if I'm talking, um, it's, it's a challenge because the brain processes um, verbal and written information uh, sequentially. So you can't pay attention to what you're reading while you're listening because essentially it's like having two people sitting next to you talking at the same time. But um, images and, and verbal are process parallel. So if you have like a fantastic image that goes with what you're talking about, it's going to actually enhance the retention um, versus detracting from it. So it's, if there's any images you could share um, or just ask us to look for certain images because, you know, we're pretty good at finding ones that are 
copyright free, but meaningful images. Um, that's a great way to really enhance the lecture and not, um, not, not distract from it by having um, material on screen. So yeah, and they, they actually, Ron's showing it on the screen right now, how they have a, um, one where you know, your eye automatically goes to the little image in the corner and the bullet points aren't necessary if you're talking about it you know, with the audio. And you, you actually see, you get a lot more when you're actually just looking at the image itself, so. Um. Great, okay, here I'll go on to the next one then, uh, deconstructing the lecture. And we have probably about four minutes here, so. Yeah, we can just run through it real fast and you guys can look at it on your own. So essentially we put most of the material, Ron, if you just wanna click through to the next sure. one. Um, uh, basically, for getting a lecture, you want to get their attention. You want to start with a hook, um, generally one that relates to what you're talking about, not my cat. But um, And I forgot to put the link in here, but I will add it. And it's got a great, um, great explanation of each of these. But if you start with even just a short video where you tell a story about your personal experience with this at work, it'll get them engaged and they'll be interested. Or a shocking statistic, um, healthcare statistic that relates. Um, just something to get them to be like, wow, okay, I want to read more, and then um, go on. Okay, um, next one. And then inform them of the purpose. Why is it important? You want to motivate them and link what they'll be learning personally um, right now to what it's gonna, how it's going to help them in their future in healthcare IT. And we want to keep relating everything to what they're going to be doing with it um, when they get out in the workplace. And then just a brief overview of the lecture. You have the overview generally on your overview and reading page, but that's for like the whole module. That's everything they're gonna be reading. So just a brief um, overview. What are we gonna talk about right now? Um, just to get them ready. And then you wanna recall relevant prior knowledge. And this might be from a prior course, uh, like Montasser's teaching 435. And prior they had learned about SWOT analysis in 375. Um, so you can recall, you know, okay, so remember when you learned, we're going to bring this back, we're going to work on it again. Um, or you might um, come up with an analogy. And if there's information that they shouldn't be including, and do that as well. You know, I always have to tell my students, don't, you know, forget what you know about debits and credits, uh, because it's probably wrong, and, and start over now. So if there's something that you think they might have not quite right, like with the analytics stuff, just tell them to start fresh. Um, but yeah, so next. And, and now you finally get to introduce the new information. And um, so yeah, so here's where you're gonna pre um, present the information and examples. And um, that's where we can help with creating, creating material for you from your written content. And it helps to have like a, a combination of narrative, like you talking in the first person, and then facts that we can make interactive, that we can turn into to flip cards or tabbed information um, so that it's not just you talking so that they're actually engaging with the screen to stay focused on it. Okay, and then practice. We wanna get some interaction and not graded interaction, just get them answering some questions, practicing with it, um, and make sure that there's feedback so that they know if they're on track. And then summarize and review, and this can simply be a PDF with some bullets of what they should have learned, um, or a concept map, or just a paragraph summary, just something that they can take away. And then this is one of the most critical steps, and this is to transfer the learning and to get them thinking about how are they going to be using this. Um, test it out now, but make sure that they're putting it in perspective of when they get into the workplace, what are they going to do with this and why does it have meaning for them? How are they going to use this knowledge? And then close, close it out, out. Um, on a positive note, just re-motivate, close, you know, point out how much they've learned and uh, get them started on their activities for the week. All right, thank you, Lauren. So, so yeah, um, I think, I'll, a lot of us know this in in, uh, in theory, at least, especially since since most of us have um, taught before or even have a, a master's or doctorate in, in, in uh, related education. So, but just putting the theory into practice. All right. So um, for the next part here, this is uh, implementing the core competencies, and I, um, uh, I'm inviting Montasa here to talk about core competencies 
relating to our program. So Montasser, if you wanted to, to talk for a minute here, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thank you. So can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good, thank you. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, basically, uh, the healthcare industry, uh, including the healthcare informatics and all other uh, segments of the industry is uh, really a booming industry. And uh, it's becoming more like a business uh, due to the uh, market forces, dynamics, and the rise of uh, consumerism and the global uh, impact of healthcare. Uh, and employers are really uh, demanding that uh, academic programs, uh, whether they are bachelor degree or graduates, Degree, uh, programs to really prepare our students to face uh, the uh, opportunities and the challenges uh, that are uh, impacting uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, there are many surveys that uh, have been given to the healthcare uh, executives uh, each year about uh, their uh, expectations of um, healthcare graduates. And uh, those graduates, you know, they could be undergraduate or uh, in graduate degrees, but uh, basically they are really looking at um, graduates who really uh, understand, comprehend, and uh, gain core competencies uh, in the specific uh, subject field. Uh, if you look at the uh, trend in healthcare, uh, there are two booming uh, subcategories within the healthcare industry. It's the healthcare informatics, the digital transformation, and also uh, the uh, shift into uh, healthcare data analytics. As a result, uh, there is huge demand uh, for um, graduates who really have um, become a, a competent in their skills. And our program, uh, it's really a, an excellent program that we have right now, yet we need to really uh, look at our courses and to map those into a specific uh, core competencies. Uh, Right now, the Commission on Accreditation for Healthcare Informatics and Information Management Education, they are really uh, proposing a draft for 2018, which is gonna include uh, uh, core competencies for uh, uh, healthcare informatics. And uh, it's still a draft, but it's there, and uh, pretty much uh, once they approve it, uh, they will announce it announced this to the uh, industry and uh, pretty much uh, when a graduate in a, from an informatics program is applying for a job, uh, the, um, the organization or the employer will ask the students about specific core competencies and they will require that they provide them with a mapping of the core competencies in their courses and in the program. Uh, this is a dynamic uh, subject matter that we are really talking about here. Um, and many uh, healthcare uh, programs within the uh, uh, healthcare industry have already implemented uh, core competencies. And the core competencies could range from 25 to 45 competencies. So what uh, I'm trying to introduce here to our HCI programs is what we have right now is we are looking at um, what we currently have is a course outcomes and, uh, and those course outcomes are mapped to the program outcomes and the college outcomes, which is really a good idea. But uh, the recent development is we are moving into core competencies and uh, we really have some work to do in our program to map the core competencies. We need to agree on those, and then we need to really map those core competencies to each specific course. So uh, when the students are really moving from one course to another or from one quarter to another, they really are getting the core competencies they need to have. And when we really map the core competencies to the, uh, core, uh, to the uh, program outcomes, and uh, to the uh, program mission, vision, and uh, values, and to the college, we really are ensuring that uh, we are providing or equipping or uh, giving the students the, uh, the most important core competency they need to have and the employers are looking for. 
Uh, bottom line is this, uh, employers are looking for uh, problem solvers, looking for graduates with high level of critical thinking skills, and the ability to really uh, uh, tackle issues related to healthcare informatics. Um, so I'm introducing this topic to our program uh, in order to really start a discussion. Uh, it's not gonna be done over uh, one meeting or two meetings, it's really a, a long process. But we have to really right now pay attention to it uh, because, um, you know, um, employers are requesting this and they are demanding this. And then right now the accreditation agencies are working on this and it become a reality very soon. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing discussion and this is just the starting point and I really need to, uh, uh, you know, um, take this uh, effort as a serious uh, matter because um, we are really uh, supplying the marketplace with the graduates who really uh, will be hired by the employers and employers are becoming very uh, picky and demanding. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'll, uh... I'll second Montasser's uh, question about if there's any questions or comments. Um, uh, really about the the, the uh, whole presentation here, but also focused on what Montasser was just talking about um, uh, with the competencies, uh, maybe even relating to the to class you're teaching. You know, I'm teaching right now 435, which is the uh, healthcare informatics operation. And uh, pretty much we are really exposing the students to really uh, tactical uh, planning, tactical implementations, and also we're tying together many uh, operational and to some degree strategic uh, concept. Uh, so we're looking at um, HR issues, we're looking at change management issues, we're looking at uh, uh, operation issues, we're looking at also uh, IT issues, informatics uh, that have uh, operational consequences. So those are really pretty much are uh, part of the core competencies that um, uh Okay. Um, are you still talking, Montasser? Because we can't hear you. Okay. Um, Are you there? Is anybody there? I'm here. Okay. I'm here. I'm still here. All right. Thank you. Well, we're actually uh, just about ready to, to to shut down here, anyways. But um, uh, I just follow up with with Montasser was talking about with with the competencies and just say that that we'll definitely be tapping into your resources as the subject matter experts, as the instructors, because we want to be um, even though. We recognize that our program is, uh, is, is very good, of course. We want to, there's gonna be a lot of room for improvement here. We find that there's, uh, uh, for example, we find that there's some redundancy within some of the courses that we'll need to tap into and, and evaluate and so forth. Um, all right, so at, at, at the uh, bottom of this uh, is some resources. So we have some links out for best practices, online presence, and then some more information about the three to one ratio. And so as you um, develop your own lecture content, um, if you could um, keep in mind about this uh, information that we covered, that'd be wonderful. And, uh, and our job here, uh, Jonathan, uh, Maricel, Lauren, and myself, our jobs here are, are to absolutely support you in, in the material that you create and to, to support the students as well. Are there any other comments or, uh, or questions? This is really good stuff. Thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you, Dale. Appreciate that. All right. I um, concur with that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it looks great, Ron. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, um, uh, Lauren and Maricel, for helping to put this together. And the time ask the, the, the uh, time on task survey is awesome. And that's something that Maricel uh, uh, initiated. 
And it's not something that I've seen before in other programs. It, we, there's, uh, surprisingly, there's not a lot of data like that. So um, hopefully we'll be um, doing more of this. So I'll go ahead and wrap it up now and uh, say thank you for attending. We really appreciate your time, taking your time out of your day to come on in. And uh, we'll be in touch with you soon about having another one of these as we go, go into next year. So, um, and we'll talk with Kim about that. Kim, did, uh, did you have anything you wanted to say before we exit? Um, I guess I could say a few things. I, for one, thank you for taking uh, your group expertise in instructional design and shedding it, shedding um, some expertise and sharing that knowledge with our instructors and vice versa, the instructors that are in this call. Um, you bring a lot of work, real life work experience knowledge and having studied this material and what you offer to the students is an opportunity to learn more from people that are on the front lines, if you will. Um, and so what Montasa was getting at at the end of, in terms of the core competencies, that is an area that um, I've talked with the Dean and that is an area that she'd like us to continue to move forward with. Um, because we're a professional technical program at a community college that is focused on preparing students for uh, roles in the community, she, if this is something that the industry is going to be pushing towards, then she'd like us to have the agility to make changes in the program that will make sure that what we deliver to students is what they need to be successful. Um, so my hope is that, again, we'll continue these conversations, we'll continue to do the research we're doing on time on task in the classes through the remainder of this academic year. And hopefully with the, um, once we have a full-time program chair uh, hired, my hope is that happens sooner than later, hopefully next year, um, then we can really start to dig our feet into identifying core competencies and reframing a lot of our courses around that. All right, wonderful. All right, and I'll just uh, second that and say that we are, we're, um, we really enjoy working with all of you and we're, um, we're here to support you. So thanks again. And um, unless there's any other comments or questions, I'll go ahead and close out. Thank you. I'll, just, I'll just say one thing, Ron. Uh, oh, okay, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, so all the things that uh, Montasa was talking about uh, with critical thinking, uh, you know, life practice, you know, being able to problem solve. If uh, any instructors have any questions about how they can implement some of those things in their assignments, uh, again, feel free to reach out to me. I can I can help work and, and, and help help you work in, on your assignments, discussions, whatever it is. Try to get some more of those critical thinking elements in, involved. All right. Well, this this was really awesome to have this meeting, and we we'll look forward to having. Um, uh, future ones as well, so we can engage with you and learn from you. This is great. Okay, thank you all, and uh, we'll be in touch with you soon about next quarter. Thank you. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.